Welcome to the Big Bass Podcast, the fishing show where size matters. I'm Ken Duke. And I'm Terry Battisti. Our producer and engineer is Nathan Benson. And before we get in, uh, in, into this episode of the Big Bass Podcast, I just want to thank all of the people that supported us on uh, our first live ish, or, you know, episode last week. Uh, it was phenomenal. Ken, I mean... Yeah, heart signs, all that, you know, emotional stuff that you're so uh, into these days. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was it was amazing. I mean, I think at the most, or at the, the peak, we had 110 people on. Over the course of the entire three hours, uh, we had close, to, or it was well over 300 people total. Um, the numbers just blew us away. Yeah, and, and a lot of folks have watched since then. In fact, yeah. that, that live show has been gotten bigger numbers than episode three of our david hayes series yeah which is kind of shocking since yeah. episode, hey, episode three of the david hayes series come on folks if you haven't listened to it already please give it a give it a shot yeah yeah i mean it, it the, we we honestly didn't think that anybody was going to show up for the live issue or episode uh we thought we in fact, we had, we had three pages of questions that we had written ourselves that we were going to call email questions, uh, and we didn't have to use any of them. So, again, thank you, everybody. Very so, much. That was, but, a, that was a great time. We're going to do it again. In fact, uh, we're going to do a live episode every two months from now on, and uh, we'll, we'll do it with just, just Terry, myself, and Nathan twice a year. But the other four live programs, we're going to have special guests. And we're going to kick that element off on June 6th with Stephen Barden, uh, Major League Fishing's uh, biologist, fabulous fisheries biologist, a guy who knows so much about big bass. And, and a lot of y'all have, have emailed questions in to us. And, and rather than forward them back to Stephen, because I think a lot of people probably have the same questions, we're just going to have Stephen on. And, uh, and you guys can can have at it and, and get all your questions in. So Stephen Barden, June yep. 6th, live. At 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. So, there you go. Anyway, uh, this episode of the Big Bass Podcast is all about Ohio's record largemouth bass. Now, we've gotten a lot of people uh, requesting from the, the Midwest uh, you know, please do Illinois, please do Ohio, please do uh, Indiana, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, we decided to tackle Ohio's because it's got a pretty interesting uh, story behind it. Oh, uh, Terry, we have in this episode, we have fencing, we have fighting, we have torture, we have revenge. <laughs> we have giants and monsters and, and chases and, and, and escapes. And we have true love and miracles. <laughs> It's like, it's like the Princess Bride. It's got a little bit of everything. <laughs> well, we're going to dig into the Buckeye State's record bass history and give you details on eight different bass that have held the state record since 1955, as well as a lowdown on two fish that didn't set the record when they were caught. Maybe they should have. Yeah, this is kind of this is a departure for us. Rather than basically talking about one fish, one incident here, we thought it would be fun and uh, effective, hopefully, for us to kind of pick a state and a species and, and dive right into it, give you a kind of a, a fuller history of that state and that species. And we're, we're kicking it off with Ohio. And we cannot tell the story of Ohio's record bass without going into the unusual way that Ohio fishing records are maintained. In, instead of being overseen by the state wildlife department, like they are in just about every other state except Louisiana, uh, Ohio records are managed by the Outdoor Writers of Ohio, an outdoor communicator group. Yeah, and, and they have all the usual rules uh, that most state agencies, you know, make, make anglers abide by. Uh, the fish must be examined by a state fisheries biologist. The weighing of the fish must be witnessed by two people. They require a close-up photo of the fish and all the fish submitted for record uh, must be legally taken. Yeah, the Outdoor Writers of Ohio also require that the fish be kept frozen and intact until they make their decision because they may want to examine the fish. And as in some other states, fish taken from pay lakes are ineligible and that's gonna come up in one of our segments here. Exactly. 
So that kind of sets the stage for what we're going to talk about here with respect to the Ohio state record largemouth bass. Uh, and, but now let's dive into the sometimes strange but always interesting world of Ohio record largemouth bass. So, yeah, too, we got to kick it off with with the earliest state record bass that we can find from Ohio, and, and it yeah. comes in 1955. And 55 is is not particularly early for a state to start state fishing records. It's not late particularly either. I think it's probably about average for a state where the largemouth bass is not perhaps the most pursued fish in the state. Mm -hmm. And the earliest state record we can find is a nine pound fish caught by William Hemmerly Jr. of Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. And he caught that fish in September of 1955 out of a gravel pit near the town of Remington, Ohio. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was a, a, a police dispatcher. Um, and the, the interesting thing about this is like you said, the 1955 deal, um, this is where James A. Henshaw essentially started fishing. He fished in Ohio in the Miami River, right? Yeah, absolutely. He caught his first bass there on the 4th of July, I think about exactly. 1955 or something Exactly. Like that. So maybe bass fishing was a little bit bigger in Ohio than we thought, you know? That is, you know, that's, you're absolutely right about that. You know, that's one of the cool things about this episode is that uh, Ohio factors in in so many ways into this story apart from the fact that all these fish came from Ohio. There's just a lot mm -hmm. of Ohio in Ohio, it seems. <laughs> yeah, yep. <laughs> um, go ahead. No, I was going to say, uh, tell us about the next guy who did not set a state record, but, but could have. Yeah, so this is an interesting one. Uh, the angler was Elwood Morningstar, or Morningstar. I, I, I don't know if this was a typo in, in the... Uh, publications that we that we found uh the weight of the fish was nine pounds seven and one half ounces it was 27 inches long that is a really long fish i mean a fish if that fish was caught anywhere in florida or texas or california that would have been a, a could have easily weighed 12 13 14 pounds um really really long skinny fish we don't have a girth measurement on it uh the date of the catch was sometime in 1961 it was caught in a gravel pit in South Miamisburg, Ohio, uh, and the guy was using a minnow, a, you know, live minnow, I assume. It was a spinning outfit, uh, and although there were several witnesses watched the angler hook, land, and weigh the bass, he did not get a photograph of it, and as a result, the OWO disqualified the catch. Yeah, that was interesting to me, Terry, because, you know, usually the reason that you want to have a photograph of the fish is because otherwise it's hard to prove that the fish existed that the fish was of roughly the proportions uh, of a giant like that and and to prove species and 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 every all those things so they had he had did everything right and yet they disqualified him for what i think was the least of the rules the photograph and yeah. uh so anyway um yeah. Elwood Morning Store does not get the state record. The state record nope. still belongs to, to William Hemmerly Jr. at nine pounds even until, yep. take us to 1962, doctor. So we got 1962, we have Bill Ferenczi. He catches a nine pound, two ounce uh, largemouth that was 24 inches in uh, length, 19 inches in girth. Uh, he catches it at a Leesville Reservoir in Carroll County, Ohio. This is a lake. I would consider it's a lake because now it's about a thousand acres. And he catches it on the infamous nighttime topwater bait of all time, the uh, Fred Arbogast jitterbug. And guess what color it was? Black. Um, he was fishing before daylight, so he was fishing at night at 4 a.m. Uh, and, you know, in order to, to land this fish, he ends up holding the flashlight in his, in his mouth. Yeah, he that's had all pretty kinds much of, all that was written. Yeah, he had all kinds of problems landing this fish. He ultimately had to hold a flashlight in his mouth. And remember, folks, we're not talking about the little pen lights that we have these days. He probably had a full-size flashlight stuck in yeah. his mouth. And I think he was fishing from the bank, although the, the articles are not clear. Uh, but anyway, the, the record gains two ounces in 1962. Yep. Uh, Hemmerly mm -hmm. is eclipsed. 
The record now belongs to, to Bill Ferenczi. And uh, he's got it for actually less than a year uh, until a 15-year-old kid from Cleves, Warsaw, Pike, Ohio, named Rick Sage, uh, using a black cream plastic worm attached to a homemade harness, catches a nine-pound, four-ounce largemouth. And, and it was 24 and a half inches long, caught out of a farm pond. And, and Terry, one of the interesting things about this was just a couple of weeks after, after this young man catches this bass out of a farm pond, it winds up being bulldozed to make way for a new subdivision. So record-setting lake of only about one acre, and then it's gone. Progress is what we call it, right? Yeah, who knows what <laughs> yeah. genetics were lost? Who knows what, what right. great habitat was lost? Who knows if, if there was potentially another record to be caught out of there one day? Uh, instead, it just got bulldozed, and, and, and now it's, uh, you know, somebody's garage. Yep, exactly. So now we're going to talk about the Whopper from Chopper. This was a fish caught by Ed Hutchins. Uh, it was a nine pound, eight ounce fish that uh, measured out at 24 and a half inches long. Uh, the date of the catch was May 26th, 1966. So the record held for three years. Uh, 66, it's broken on Chopper Lake in Washington County, Ohio. And it's 11 acres in, uh, in size. So I would still consider that a pond. Uh, but it was reserved for the patrons of a motel. Pay Lake restriction of OWO, okay? An outdoor writer in Upper Sandusky, Ohio. And one of the people on the OWO Record Fish Committee speculates that the fish may have been planted in the lake, okay? All right, so Ed Hutchins... Go ahead. You want to talk about Ed, Ed here a little bit? No, go ahead, man. Go for it. <laughs> Hutchins was the outdoor writer for the Columbus Dispatch, uh, which makes him a writer, and he was part of the OWO. And his fish gets put in as the state record. Yeah, and despite the fact that it was caught from a body of water, that you pro in some way you had to pay to fish. You had to be mm -hmm. staying out. Now, what this guy from Sandusky said, Upper Sandusky, Ohio, this outdoor writer, um, he said, oh, it was, it was from a motel and you could only uh, fish there if you were paying to stay there. And he really denigrated everything about it. Uh, the Lakeside Resort Colony, which is, where, uh, which is where Hutchins caught this nine and a half pound fish, was hardly a motel. It was an 837-acre recreation facility that included an 18-hole <laughs> golf course, a clubhouse, restaurants, boating and water skiing facilities. It was, it was a lot bigger than that. But clearly Hutchins had some detractors within the uh, Outdoor Riders of Ohio. But he obviously had more friends than this guy from Upper Sandusky because Hutch Hutchins ultimately got certified as the, uh, as the new Ohio State Record Largemouth back in 1966. Yep, kind of shady if you ask me. <laughs> but like every other record in Ohio, Terry, it doesn't last for long. No, no. So let's go on to Terry Pierce. You gonna go ahead? All, all, all you, brother. All right, all right. So we got Terry Pierce, uh, May first, nineteen seventy, catches a nine pound, nine ounce fish, um, and this one way or is it, its length is twenty two and a half inches long, nineteen inches in girth. Uh, from Lake Logan in uh, Lake Logan State Park. So this is about a 400-acre lake. And the, the, the bait he was using was a hustler or a rebel plug, depending upon the source that you read it from, you know, in these newspapers. Yeah, hey, we you, see... you read three newspapers, you get three different answers, right? So true. Now, I have no <laughs> idea what, what the hustler lure is, and I'm mm -hmm. guessing that the rebel plug would have been probably... You know their their variation on the the Rapala floating minnow. You know the original yeah. rebel uh, floating minnow. But I'm not mm -hmm. sure what the hustler lure might have been. But multiple sources say each one. Multiple sources say hustler. Multiple sources say the rebel plug. Yeah. The interesting thing is that he had been camping there with his dog and caught a 44 inch muskie earlier in the week. Uh, he put the muskie in a grocery store freezer and was about to pick it up to, and drive home when he realized the store had closed for the night, and so he decided to stay another night, 
and that's when he caught the bass was early the next morning. And so he catches that 9-9 nine, nine and, and, uh, and bumps Hutchins out uh, by one ounce three, yeah. years, three years later. And that's 1970. So since we know that nobody's allowed to hold the largemouth record in Ohio for very long, just uh, you know, a couple of years later, uh, mm -hmm. Tom Buck, uh, fishing a strip mine pond in Locust Grove, Ohio, uh, adds some significant weight to this to this record. He he tacks yep. on another nine ounces and go ratchets it up ratchets it up to 10 pounds, two ounces, eclipsing the Pierce record. This is a 23 inch fish with an 18 inch girth. And once again, Terry, he's the throwing the jitterbug. Bug. The black jitterbug. Um, although we, we may not know the color of this one, but we're not sure about uh, the color on that. And, uh, but, and this is a musky jitterbug folks, which is kind of the legendary big bass lure and the one everybody used to want to throw at night. And still a lot of people do, but that was yep. the bait, the, the bait that, that buck fished was a jitterbug. We're going to talk more about the jitterbug in, in just a few minutes. Mm -hmm. Ken, let's go to Bill Braden. Bill Braden. Ah, <laughs> this is, this is what drew me to Ohio and the, and the record largemouth thing. Uh, Bill Braden. Okay, let's we'll set the stage a little bit. The, uh, the state record in, uh, in Ohio at this point is just nine pounds, nine ounces. It belongs to Terry Pierce. Um, but then along comes this guy from Bill Braden. He lives in Canton, Ohio. And he, on August 24th, 1972, which I'll throw this out there, was the day Aaron Martins was born. Um, Bill Braden is out there fishing on Mogador Reservoir in Portage County, Ohio. It's a little over a thousand acres, owned and operated by the city of Akron. It had been impounded in 1939 uh, to provide water to industry. You can still fish this lake today, but it's restricted to electric motors only. Back then you couldn't have any motor of any kind on it. Mm -hmm. So Braden's out there rowing his boat around. And he catches this 13 pound, one ounce fish. He hasn't just edged the record here, Terry. Like it had been for the previous 10, 15 years. Yeah, for, for the previous almost 20 years, the record has yeah. been increasing by two ounces, four ounces, uh, in one case, nine ounces. But this time he's blown it away by three and a half pounds. Yeah. The, the, the length of this fish is either 23 and a half or 25 or 25 and a half inches, uh, depending on which source you want to buy into. And it's girth 22 or 22 and a quarter. Uh, and according to a scale sample, the fish was about 11 years old. For an 11 year old fish to reach 13 pounds in Ohio, that would That's, be extraordinary. Yeah, extraordinary. absolutely. Yep. Um, and it's another case of a, a plastic worm getting the job done. And keep in mind, plastic worms were invented in Ohio. Uh, this case, it was a man's jelly worm and grape. As was the Fred Arbogast jitterbug. There you go, yeah. The look Akron, at, Ohio. <laughs> look at all, look at all now, now the, the man's jelly worm came out of Ufala, Alabama. But, yeah. but look at all the Ohio baits that are being used to catch Ohio record fish. That's very it's unusual. pretty cool. It's you don't awesome. see that anywhere else. <laughs> Um, so, so he catches this fish and he's using good equipment. He's using a Fenwick casting rod. He's got an ambassador 5,000. So clearly this yep. is a serious angler. He's a member of the local bass club. He, um, you know, he fishes tournaments. Um, and now he comes up with this 13 pound one ounce fish and he wants to get it certified and recognized as a state record because he knows yep. what the state record is. This is a guy who'd caught an eight pound, nine ounce fish from the same lake, uh, just a year earlier. So he knows mm -hmm. what a big fish looks like. And of course, he submits his catch to the Outdoor Riders of Ohio, and, and they set up a three-person panel to investigate this fish. And, and Terry, the, the letter from one of the guys on the panel uh, that he sent to the chairman of the Record Fish Committee was published in its entirety back then, and it yes, is it a was. hoot. It is, it is a hoot. <laughs> Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, he. Uh, Go ahead. <laughs> no, no, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm still laughing about that letter. It's, it's hilarious. Yeah, it, it, it so, the, the letter essentially said that, 
you know, I'm not going to sign this fish on. You guys do what you want. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah, there's too many, too many questions about this fish. But were they legit questions? That's... Exactly. He, he makes a lot of points in this letter. And one is, he says, oh, we're still waiting for some out-of-state opinions about scale studies and, and yep. the results of some tissue samples. And, uh, and we're, you know, the, the Ohio Division of Wildlife uh, uh, saw it the day it was caught, but it was near death, sitting in a minnow tank at a store about 30 miles away. Uh, mm -hmm. He points out that there were no witnesses to the catch and that the angler could not prove he was even there at the lake that day. Uh, one of the reasons he couldn't prove he was at the lake was because you were supposed to pay a ramp fee before you, you launched your boat and went fishing, and the angler didn't do that. Um, yeah, and there was no record of him renting a boat. No record of him renting a boat, no record of him getting the launch fee, no record of anybody seeing him there, no record of anybody seeing his vehicle there. Some issues. Yeah. Um, what, what troubled this outdoor rider though, along with those things was that although there were other anglers on the water, Braden didn't stop to show the fish off to them. Which uh, is kind of weird. Which is, well, maybe, but you know, who are we to be the arbiter of how a guy should react to catch a, a record fish? You know, uh, instead what he did was he started paddling because remember, no motors out there, started paddling for the shore and the ramp, which is about three quarters of a mile away. Mm -hmm. uh, now, after he left the ramp, he drove right past a roadside bait store, which was also a fish weighing station, and he didn't stop to show the fish there either. Yep. Um, the superintendent didn't see Braden, his car, nothing, like we talked about. Yeah. Uh, he, he even accused Braden of stealing a mounted duck out of the superintendent station. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this Braden guy was not liked. Um, he, was, he was not liked. He was kind of a sketchy dude. He did have a hunting violation on his record. He, uh, he was out hunting ducks one day, and he had three already in his bag. The limit was four. He claimed he shot one more time, and the one shot took two ducks down, and so he was one over his limit, and he got a citation and had to pay a fine for that. Um, That's coyote food. I mean, you you don't take that extra duck home. You leave it and 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 you know give it to the coyotes. <laughs> Anybody well, the, would do that. The superintendent out at the lake was really skeptical about it. He said, you know, hey, if if this is a thirteen pound fish. Were all the 9, 10, 11, and 12 pounders, which would have almost have had to show up for mm -hmm. it to produce a 13. And, and the, the record was his 8, 9, right? Or well, it was it I, another I, 8, 9? That was, well, it wasn't, he didn't have the state record, of course, but he did have what was a nearly the, lake. the yeah, the lake record. Um, yeah. So, yeah, he, he had it. Um, and, and his excuse for not having a, you know, for his excuse for not having the required boat permit was not really an excuse. He said he had fished the lake multiple times, at least 10 times in the past, and had never purchased the required boat permit, <laughs> which is not a really, not really a great excuse. You know, it's like saying, uh, well, officer, I speed through this area all the time. Um, not, yeah. not quite cool. He claimed he caught the yeah. fish at about 1130. Then he rode three quarters of a mile back to the ramp. He did not have the fish hanging from a stringer. Instead, he had the fish laying in the bottom of his boat. This is August. Had the fish yeah. laying in the bottom of his boat covered by a wet rag. And when he got to the ramp, he wrapped his fish in a wet towel. And then he drove 31 minutes to the home of the Bass Club secretary and showed the fish off there. Uh, they took yep. some pictures. And then he drove to the store where it was officially weighed. And that store was yeah. owned by a buddy of his. Um, so the fish was out of the water for at least an hour and 15 minutes before it was weighed and then put in the minnow tank at the store. And when the biologist got there, he said the fish was still alive. That's impossible. It's not a catfish. You could do that with a catfish. <laughs> you, you can't can do, do that. that with a bait. Holy mackerel. Yeah, I mean, it, there's just a ton of red flags red lights going up i mean it just it doesn't look good for Braden. does so, not look good for uh, Braden, and it gets a little bit worse 
but mm -hmm. uh, worse perhaps only in the eyes of the uh, outdoor riders of Ohio. Um, and here's one of the great names in uh, the Big Bass podcast. A uh, fisheries management supervisor for, for the Ohio Division of Wildlife, his name was Clayton Lakes. Uh, and Mr. Lakes, <laughs> Mr. Lakes did an investigation and found that the, the fish, Braden's fish, had some genetic origin associated with the Florida subspecies. Uh, and we know that Florida subspecies is the one with the greatest propensity for growth and so forth. And a professor yeah. at Ohio State University, wide left, as the University of Georgia grad here would tell you, wide left and short, uh, this professor at Ohio State tested scale samples and the pyloric cacal tips, which are finger-like projections uh, at the junction of the stomach and the intestines. Mm -hmm. And he said it was likely a Florida bass, but other testing they did was inconclusive. Now, uh, did they do a scale count? Uh, you know, all the... that's how they got the age at 11 years. Well, no, they, they, so well, they, they, they did a scale the count. Yes. The, yeah. They did talking about scale count along the, yeah, right. Yes, they, yes, they did. And that was in, The scale count was inconclusive. Um, this other thing, this, this, pyloric cacal tips uh, indicated that it was uh, within the the range of the Florida bass uh, and not a northern bass. Uh, and you actually talked to Barden about this. I did talk to Stephen Barden about this and 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 thank goodness we're going to have Stephen on in a, in a couple of weeks to go yeah. deeper into this if, if there's interest on, on the folks uh, listening. But uh, the Ohio Outdoor Writer Group wanted to point out that hey, Mogador Reservoir doesn't have the kind of forage generally, you know, needed to grow a fish of this size. And to our knowledge, nobody's ever stocked Florida bass in here. And uh, blah, 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 blah. You know, they, the, uh, but here's my favorite line, Terry. My favorite line in the letter <laughs> from this guy to the, uh, to the head honcho of the Ohio records for the Outdoor Writers Group. He said, yeah. lastly, the fish is just too damn big. For an Ohio native largemouth bass, <laughs> yeah, too damn big. Course. Yeah, yeah. It's and then what's going to happen later? We'll get there, but exactly. Yeah, we'll get that. We we'll get that one almost next. Um, yeah. But the guy said, "Hey, somebody else might sign off on this being a record, but uh, I want no part of it. I sincerely this to believe. I sincerely believe this to be a hell of a hoax." Yeah, and you know another one of the things is that they said that the measurements weren't consistent with a 13-pound fish, and I say BS. The the measurements are perfectly consistent with a 13-pound fish. Now, whether it is, it was actually a fish that was caught in 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 Ohio is another question. I mean, Braden used to go fish Santee Cooper with his friends, and he would spend time in Florida with his friends fishing bass. I mean, obviously the guy is a, a an astute bass fisherman just by looking at the tackle he had. Fenwick rods, ambassador reels, the guy knew what he was doing. So um, the last thing, the polygraph, he offered to take polygraph tests. Yeah. Uh, that's one of my favorite things. Yeah, let, me, let me backtrack for just a second, Terry, and say that yeah. that, that, that three outdoor rider panel that was assigned to investigate Braden's catch, you know, you think, oh, it was two to one. Oh, it was three to nothing. No, they were split. <laughs> One guy, this guy who wrote the letter, said, no way. He voted to reject the application. One guy said, we should make him take a polygraph. And the third guy said, oh, we should submit it to the full membership and let the full membership vote. So what a bunch of buck passers at least two of these guys were. Yeah. Um, so instead what happened was the uh, Outdoor Riders of Ohio let the board of directors vote on this fish. And what did they do, Terry? Seven zip <laughs> against it. Yeah. No, no waffling there. Seven zip. They yep. they rejected it, and so did Field and Stream. You know, because Braden submitted this to be the northern uh, largemouth uh, in their in their big fish their annual big fish contest. And yeah, they, I mean, this is they they didn't give that up until seventy eight to IGFA. Right. So they're right. still doing the Field and Stream. You know, big fish contest. And so many great lines came out of, of this story. Uh, for example, the, uh, the chairman of the Outdoor Riders of Ohio Record Fish Committee said, the fish shows signs of being in Florida. 
or some other southern area at some time was it, during its life. Was it life. vacationing down there? Was it? Did it have a tan? <laughs> was it wearing sandals? Did it have a white belt and socks with sandals? What does that even mean? Who cares if the fish had ever been in Florida? Who cares if the fish had Florida genetics? That should not disqualify it as a record in, in the state of Ohio. It might have been some bucket biology at work. Uh, we can't really tell. And the genetics of it all doesn't give us the answer either. Uh, Braden, as you might imagine, was pretty pissed off. Uh, he threatened some legal action, but as far as we can tell, he never pursued that. And, right. uh, and as you said, the, uh, the polygraph thing got interesting when, uh, when Bassmaster Magazine decided to, to dig into that story and, uh, and, and tell it. And the guy who told the story in Bassmaster Magazine was a guy named, uh, I believe it was uh, Miller was his name. And he wrote a pretty good rundown of what was going on there with the, the Braden fish. And, and, and he asked Braden if he would take a polygraph. And Braden said, sure. And, but Braden said, if I take a polygraph and I pass, you got to guarantee me that I go in the record book. And, and the outdoor writer and the outdoor writers of Ohio would not agree to that. Yeah. Well, the outdoor writers of Ohio also said, well, yeah, you, you'll take a polygraph, but you've told this, the, this lie so many times you probably believe it. That's another one of the great. That's another one of the great lines out of this. Is is you know you 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 can't. Braden wasn't going to win from the word go. Was not gonna was not gonna win. And yeah, there's a sh ton of uh, questionable stuff going on in it. So yeah, it's I'm probably not saying. Best. I'm not saying there wasn't a lot of reason to doubt this catch. I'm just saying. That there's also a lot of reason in this case you for don't why like you should not let putting... the outdoor writer associations <laughs> well, be in charge yeah, of that's, state records. That's the number one thing. Uh, but you, you're just mad that a Florida fish didn't get put in a, as a state record. That's what what what's got we've, your craw right now, <laughs> Terry. We've got all we've got all the other states. Don't worry about it. We got them all. Yeah. We're basically we got a, basically got them all. Oh um, gosh, yeah, just so. just craziness in, in Ohio with that one. A um, yep. couple years later, what's got to happen? By law in the state of Ohio, Terry, what has to happen approximately every two years? you got to break the largemouth bass record. And that happens again in 1974 with William H. Flesher, uh, who weighs a 10-pound, 11-ounce fish. So now he's beaten Buck uh, with a 26-and-a-half-inch fish that had a 19-inch girth. And he catches it out of a strip mine pond in Wellston, Miggs County, Ohio. Um, live bluegill was was the bait that he used, and this is another really really cool story. Yes. So so Flesher is there at the strip pit fishing bluegill, and he's got a string of bluegill, you know, uh, in the water, tied off to a stump or a rock or something. And he sees this big bass come up and take a swipe at his stringer. And what does the smart angler do uh, when something like that happens? He pins a bluegill on a bait, puts it below a bobber, casts it out, and the next thing you know, he's on a 10-pound, 11-ounce fish. Absolutely. And, and you know, for, for folks who are wondering, is it, is it okay to use bluegill for bait? Because in some states, it's not. Uh, you know, bluegill is a game fish in every state I'm aware of, and, and in most states, you're not allowed to use a game fish to catch another game fish. Uh, right. But in Ohio, in Ohio, at least at that time, uh, you could use a game fish as bait, provided that game fish you're using as bait was caught with a hook and line. So that was kind of a, a an interesting exception to yeah. uh, what would be the, the rule in, in most states. Mm-hmm. Another two years goes by, Terry Battisti, and what happens? It's like clockwork. Uh, yeah, it's nuts. It, An alarm goes off. This, that's what makes Ohio so bloody interesting. Is I mean, we and, and they're fairly well documented in the news in newsprint. So anyway, uh, May 26, 1976, Roy Landsberger. And this is the one that is going to make you think, hmm. Maybe the Braden fish wasn't 
just too big. That's right. right? They had disqualified yeah. Braden's bass at 13 pounds, one ounce. But Terry, tell them about the Bra tell them about the Landsberger fish. Yeah, so it was caught again May 26, 1976. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. And let's oh. remember that let's remember that statement of that outdoor rider. It's just too damn big for an Ohio largemouth. That 13 yeah. one is too damn big. So what is Landsberger's fish? It's 13 two. Um, and I mean that's that's it beats it by one ounce. Uh, and he catches it from a private farm pond on the Dunhaven tree farm in Carroll County, Ohio. And and this is where Landsberger worked. So it was a tree farm. They were growing Christmas trees. Uh, Landsberger worked uh, at that farm. Landsberger was a Vietnam vet, uh, and this is the job that he had, was doing, you know, after he got back from Vietnam. And, you know, he'd obviously been doing it for a couple of years. But because he was working on the tree farm, he got access to fish this lake. And from what I understand, this lake was open to anyone. I mean, it wasn't closed. Um, but it's he fished tiny. It. it was just it's, a it tiny is, lake. Yeah, it was, tiny it was a it was a, a one acre pond, but what happens to it in its later, you know, a couple of years later, uh, is, is a different story. And he's walking the, the dam of this pond and he had seen a big fish, uh, chasing bait or something up against the rocks the day before and, and cast his jitterbug and it's getting dark out, cast the jitterbug parallel to the bank. And starts reeling it, and a toilet bowl flush happens. Uh, I mean, it's the only way you could describe it, I would assume. And and uh, he hooks this fish and gets it in, and he's he's pretty dang excited. So he goes and gets the owner of the tree farm, and uh, you know they they take some pictures and weigh the fish on a a, a bathroom scale, kind of like. Uh, Paul, Duclos. Northern, Paul Duclos did and and they come up with a, a 14 pound one ounce weight but they also call a department of no it wasn't the bath that wasn't the bathroom scale uh, they call a department of fish and game guy to come out real quick and he yeah. comes out and he and actually brings the babies scales. he's got his own scales and it's a baby scale one yeah. that you would weigh infants on and it pulls that scale down to 14 one and they're like they're all excited, but this fish is spitting eggs, uh, and but they can't get a Department of Fish and Game person to come out and verify it. Uh, so they they wrapped it and put it in the freezer uh, that night, and then the next day they had three people come out and and verify this fish. And when they did, it weighed 13 pounds two ounces, so it lost a pound, you know, uh, seven percent of its weight uh, overnight. Which yeah. I think we we need to talk to. I think that's well within the realm of of losing because you're you're not just losing egg weight, you're losing water weight and and stuff like that. But it it lost a a ton of weight. Um, yeah, you know, Terry, when I ahead. think of that fish, I think it was just too damn big for an Ohio largemouth. No, I don't believe exactly. That. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it was a big fish. Uh, uh, the the one of the cool things about it. So the. Uh, this one acre pond, there was not just this one pond on, on, on this tree farm. There was a number of ponds. And what they ended up doing is they ended up bulldozing all and creating one large 36 acre pond that they ended up giving to the Boy Scouts of Ohio. And, uh, but the, they still have those genetics in, in, in that big pond now. Yeah, and, so. and a cool kind of after the fact story to me, Terry is uh, uh, Landsberger continued to fish that jitterbug that he caught the state record on, and uh, about a year later, he was fishing the same bait, and he hooked a good fish, and the fish took the bait down, and, and got the lure snagged in some brush, and the fish pulled off, but the the bait was still stuck on the brush. Landsberger realized, you know, oh my gosh, this is this is the bait, so he dived in to get the lure back. And, and after that, he retired it. So thank goodness the he state record lure. Yeah. He, it's he still with it the fish. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yep. it's still with the fish. And for a while, that fish was uh, was on display in the Carrollton, Ohio Dairy Queen. I don't mm. know if it still yeah, is. But 
That'd be in the cool. DQ. <laughs> DQ, yeah. yeah the a DQ. lot of DQs in Ohio, but that's not one of them. <laughs> but but I, I keep coming back to how cool it is that so many of these Ohio fish are caught on important Ohio baits. And yeah. uh, we'd, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk a little bit about that uh, and about one of the most legendary lures of all time in the bass world. Yeah. Uh, arguably, arguably the most legendary topwater bait. Wouldn't you say? Especially for nighttime fishing. Um, oh, hands you know, down. Yeah. It, it, you, you, I remember reading Bassmaster in that 74, 75, through the early 80s. And if you were talking about nighttime bass fishing, it was not a nighttime bass fishing article if it didn't have an Arbogast jitterbug in it. Uh, it, it I used it as a kid uh, fishing the golf courses uh, at night. I mean, it was it, it worked. It still works. Nobody throws it anymore. You know, I mean, the funny thing is, is that, you know, there's a lot of people, a lot of bait companies or bait guys, garage bait guys that are bringing back the crazy crawler, except they're making yes. them huge. Nobody, nobody has brought back the jitterbuck. And folks that are making baits, you're missing out, you know, so. And, and people don't realize that the name Arbogast was a man's name and, and that was Fred Arbogast who uh yeah who died a long time ago he he, he died at the life. age of 47 yeah, yeah he, he died, died at the he, age he lived a short life he died in in 1847 actually he was a no he was nine, about 53 1947 I'm sorry yes yes and uh, <laughs> he was about 53 years old oh, I and, thought he was uh, I didn't think he hit 50 I thought he did yeah Look him up, folks. We'll figure Look him up. Yeah, look him up. As, as our friend uh, Brian the Carpenter would say, Google it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Arbogast spent his entire life in Akron, Ohio, and he was a world-class and record-setting uh, bait and fly caster. And he started yep. Fred Arbogast Company in 1926. And apart from the jitterbug, he's also enormously well-known for the hula popper and the Hawaiian wiggler. But Terry, you're the, you're the lure guru of the Big Bass Podcast. Tell us a little bit more about the uh, jitterbug itself. Yeah, so the jitterbug was uh, brought out in 1932, I believe. And I'm sure Bill Sonnet will correct me if I'm wrong. Yes. I uh, believe it was Bill. 1930. <laughs> yeah, hold hold him to the fire. Exactly. I think it was, I'm pretty sure it was 1932 when it was brought out. It was brought out in wood. Um, and it was manufactured that way all the way it with so it was wood with the metal cup for the uh, for the face, and I believe the lure was initially meant to be a diver, and he thought that that lip the way it was would make the bait dive better, uh, and what it ended up doing was creating this surface lure that was unmatched in its time. There was nothing like it ever, you know, prior to that. Uh, and so it was made that way all the way up until 1941, 1942, when all the metal uh, was being used for the war effort. And you can find jitterbugs that have a plastic lip, uh, and, and those are all from the, the, the 1940s, 40, 41 uh, or 42 through 45, uh, because they couldn't get the metal for the lip, and they had to use plastic. And then sometime after the war, probably in, I think it's uh, around 48 or 49, they start manufacturing a copy of it in plastic. And uh, from that point on, you could still get wood and plastic, and then eventually it just, it all went to plastic. But another thing that people don't know about Fred Arbogast is that Fred Arbogast, while he was a, a casting championship, or a ca casting champion as Ken noted, he was working for both Goodyear and B.F. Goodrich out of Ohio. He had a lot of experience in rubber. And he is the person that developed the first rubber skirt for fishing. And it was the flat hula skirt is what he called it. And he got tired of, uh, of doing his Hawaiian wigglers with deer hair and feathers. It was just too labor intensive, and he wanted to develop a skirt that could easy, be easily manufactured and just placed on the Hawaiian wiggler. And, and that's what he ended up doing, is using his 
his knowledge of the rubber industry uh, to, to make that. And then he comes up with a Hawaiian wiggler. Uh, he comes up with the hula popper uh, and, and all sorts of baits that after that, that, that ended up using that, that hula skirt. Uh, he was a, he was a hell of a, of an inventor in fishing. And uh, again, he died in an early age uh, and a guy by the name of Dick Codus, who is the people that most, associate with Arbogast Lure Company or the Fred Arbogast Lure Company because CODIS took over in the mid-50s and he had the company until it was sold to to Pratco. Yeah, CODIS was, uh, and I believe Dick CODIS may still be alive. I believe he's in his 90s. And if he yeah. is, yeah, I believe he's still with us. Um, I always thought CODIS was an interesting uh, CEO or president. He put himself in all the ads, you know. Oh, yeah. An ad didn't kind of like Ray, kind of like Ray it. Scott. There you go. <laughs> yeah. uh, now, no now, narcissism going on there. <laughs> the, the jitterbug is probably the most uh, most popular, best selling bait that uh, Arbogast ever had, and for the first fifty years of its production, uh, it is estimated, and I don't know how reliable these numbers are, Terry, but they're the best I could find. It's estimated that they sold an average of two and a half million jitterbugs a year for 50 years. That's insane. There's the word, Ken. Yeah, it is truly amazing how many, how many of those baits were manufactured and sold. I mean, it, it, that in the hula popper, I guarantee you every kid that grew up bass fishing oh. in the 60s, 70s, 80s, maybe even the 90s, had and used either a jitterbug or a hula popper or both. Yeah, I, I know that the first two topwater baits I can remember purchasing were a hula popper and a jitterbug, and they were both because of Stan Fagerstrom articles that I read <laughs> about those baits. So, salute to you, Stan. Uh, Thank you, Stan. One of the all-time great communicators in the outdoor world and a fabulous person. But... Uh, yeah. I don't know, Terry, what's your, what's your takeaway on our, our show, Ohio Largemouth? Fascinating lineage of records coming from Ohio um, that they kept pretty dang good records that we could go back to 1955 and, and, and trace them. I think the, uh, the, the Braden fish uh, is, a, is a little bit uh, of a blemish on, on the history of the records. Uh, it's either a blemish in that... That fish, the person that caught it was a hoax, or the OWA. It's a combination of both. Uh, but I'm glad that that you know it, it was broken with a 13. Uh, yes. You know, in, in, in 1976. Yes. Uh, and, and that's by, where the streak by, ends. The streak of every two years suddenly ends with Landsberger. That record it, is intact for almost yep. 50 years now. Yeah, 47 so after, years. After awesome. falling so many times so fast, you know, eight yep. times in 20 years, basically, nothing has happened in the last almost 50, 47 years. So amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So what's your take on it? Yeah, you know, I love the Ohio stories because uh, it's a cautionary tale. Don't let your outdoor writers group control your fishing records. Let the state do it. Let them come up with, with rules and regulations. Let them put some anglers and citizens on that committee. Let them put an outdoor rider on there. But don't let the outdoor riders do it. They are, Ohio mucked it up in 76. Yeah. I'm not saying that Braden deserved the record. I'm just saying that they didn't make the situation any better by the way they handled it. Uh, yep. I, I love that so many important Ohio-based baits uh, produce these records. Plastic worms, mm -hmm. which came out of Akron from cream um and, and of course the jitterbug which came out of akron uh and fred arbogast so uh yeah. just a, just a lot of fun to dig into the ohio story and uh we look forward to doing the next one can't promise yeah. it'll all be as fun as ohio but man yeah. i really enjoyed i really enjoyed this one so and, kudos and to the me, buckeye state exactly so trust us guys when we say uh, that we that we read your 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 questions to us or your suggestions, we do, uh, and we will be coming up. I know I know the folks in Illinois and 
Uh, they want us to do that. We'll get to it. Trust us. Uh, but I think it's time to slam the door on well, this episode. Before you slam the Go door, ahead. Terry, one thing. All right. When you send us an email saying, oh, yeah, we think this, you know, we always thought this, this record was shady or that record was shady. Tell us why you think it was shady because sometimes it's hard to figure out. Even if we do a deep dive into whatever literature, whatever history is out there about it, a lot of times the people who are publishing the stories are hesitant to cast aspersions upon someone. Uh, and that's where we need you to tell us maybe what direction we need to look. Is it because the angler was uh, a shady character, him or herself? Was it because that body of water wa had an issue? But if you have an idea as to why your record might be uh, less than pristine, let us know so we can try to figure it out too. Yeah. Yep. All right. So we're going to slam the door. Absolutely. Uh, but before we go, uh, please remember to subscribe. We still have quite a few uh, people that are listening and watching that, that aren't subscribed. We really appreciate you watching, but it, it helps you, it helps us out uh, if, you, if you actually subscribe to the channel. Um, don't forget to check out the website at thebigbasspodcast.com. Uh, there's a bunch of information like state records, world records uh, for spots, largemouth, and smallmouth. Uh, and if you want to contact us, you know, our emails are Ken at the Big Bass Podcast.com, Terry at the Big Bass Podcast.com, and Nathan at the Big Bass Podcast.com. We, we read everything, we read all your comments, we try to reply to everything. I don't think we have missed anything so far. Um, I hope not. And yeah, so, but uh, anyway, I'm, I'm Terry Batiste, and on behalf of my partners, Ken Duke, and Nathan Benson, thank you for joining us. Be sure to check it out, check us out next week. We'll have a new show about a different big bass and it, with a story that you will not and cannot find anywhere else. And remember, size matters. <laughs>